Hi, I'm Chappington, and welcome to Chapter 7 of Skrelga. Where we left off was at the end of the Thirty Years' War, after the Peace of Bromsebro in 1645, Skrelga became a Swedish possession. Sweden already controlled land on the North American continent, an area known as New Sweden, since 1638. Uh, this was centered around present-day Wilmington, Delaware, but given the distance between Fort Christina in New Sweden and Skrelingborg, Skrelige was set up as its own self-governing colony, Skrelige. I am terrible at pronouncing the Swedish, so <laughs> I need a little bit of slack on that. Once the appointed Swedish governor arrived, there were two main changes that happened. The first was the trade monopoly was loosened, so while trade with Sweden, including New Sweden, was preferred, uh, trade with New England and New Netherlands was now legal, and it did a lot to put the Swedish government in the people's good graces. They were finally doing something that benefited Skrelega and wasn't just for the benefit of Sweden. The second big thing was a truce with the Abenaki. This was mainly a strategic decision on the part of Sweden. Since Skrelega was isolated from New Sweden, it was surrounded by other great powers. They didn't want to get involved with unnecessary aggression with the Abenaki. The Abenaki were, of course, wary of the Skrelegan government, but were glad to not be the focus of constant aggression like they were under the Danish Skrelegans. With Skrelega changing hands multiple times over the last century, the population of the small settlement was becoming a bit more diverse. Back when Skrelega was originally settled, the population was mainly Norse-speaking immigrants, with some integration with the Abenaki people. In the 16th century, there was some trade with the Spanish Castilian colonies to the south. This did lead to a couple of Spanish merchants settling in Skrelingborg for extended stints, but there was no significant demographic shift. This changed in the 17th century, with immigration now coming from Denmark, as well as Norway, which was ruled by the same monarch, and Iceland. With Swedish rule, Swedes and Finns, who were, also, who were currently ruled by Sweden, immigrated as well. In addition, there was a small number of English people leaving Puritan New England colonies to settle in Skrelika, that was fairly minor. So in 1648, the Swedish government, governor got to work on another census, um, but this time because it was the Swedes, it was the Folkrakning. Again, my Swedish pronunciation is terrible. <laughs> Probably. There were some delays because of the Thirty Years' War, but the Falkrakning was completed by 1648, and the population had roughly doubled since the Falkertelling that the Danish government had commissioned. The total population was 1,669, with 800 of those living in Skrælingborg. The biggest chunk of growth was in Skrælingborg, where 800 people now lived. Proportionally, the biggest growth happened in Nordstalla, the former Nordstadter Nordstad, where the population climbed to 218, which was a gain of 151 people. This count also included 27 slaves, and 145 of the Skrelligans were recent imp immigrants from Sweden and Finland. At this point, the Danish and the so-called Old Skrelligan, so the pre-isolation Skrelligans, those populations were substantially mixed. The Skrelligan-speaking Skrelligan -speaking majority and a substantial Danish-speaking minority, there was a degree of mutual intelligibility and many of them were bilingual, but those proportions are for their native languages. So as you've seen on the screen so far, this is the time-lapse of, well, basically the last three years from 1645 to 48, just covering the 
initial Swedish development. The main thing you can see on screen right now is just upgrading the roads to new cobblestone. I also realized I added some old gas lamps because I was looking for, oh, some sort of like old lighting. I'm pretty sure this is still like a century or two too early for this sort of lighting, but that sort of like mass lighting. I probably wouldn't have been as much lighting outside, but could be wrong. Europe, though, a war known as either the Second Northern War or the First Northern War, depending on which side you were on, started in 1655. Primarily began as the Swedish invasion of Poland Lithuania, but it expanded to include Brandenburg Prussia, the Habsburg Monarchy, Russia, Denmark Norway, the Dutch Republic, and others. New Sweden was settled on land that was also claimed by the Dutch, so this war presented an opportunity to invade New Sweden. In the summer of 1655, Director General Peter Stuyvesant of New Netherland led most of the colonial garrison to the Delaware River. On the 11th of September, they recaptured Fort Trinity, which had been named Fort Casimir when it was originally built by the Dutch. And they besieged the capital, Fort Christina. New Sweden surrendered on the 15th of September, but was able to maintain significant autonomy under the Dutch. Stuyvesant also had plans to invade Skralica. Dutch claims extended further east than the settled areas of the Hudson Valley, and Skralica would be a strategic position to occupy. This was planned to come right after the invasion of New Sweden, but a new war broke out the very same day of Sweden's surrender. This was the Peach Tree War. The Susquehannock people were already distrustful of the Dutch due to their alliance with the Iroquois Confederacy, who are an enemy of the Susquehannocks. On the 15th of September, so the same day that New Sweden surrendered, around 600 Susquehannock warriors landed in New Amsterdam, which was very lightly defended because all of the garrison was down in New Sweden. Several outlying villages were destroyed, and hundreds of hostages were taken and ransomed. So after this attack, some of the outlying towns were permanently abandoned, and the ones that were resettled were heavily fortified, and invasion plans for Skraliga had to be put on hold. In the midst of the conflict to the southwest, the colony of Massachusetts Bay saw an opportunity for expansion. Skraliga was arguably within the charter area of the colony, so in the spring of 1656, colonists settled the village of Northney on the northernmost island of Skraliga, which was known as Northern to the Skraligans. Due to the war on the continent, the Swedish government in Skralingborg did not want to try to capture the settlement, as it might antagonize the English, and so as long as the English stayed there, the government was content to allow them to remain for now. Then in 1657, New Netherland had sufficiently recovered from the Peachtree War that it was ready to begin its invasion of Skralica. This was controversial because Skralica was still fairly distant from New Amsterdam and the consequences of the last invasion were pretty severe. But the war in Europe was still going and the Dutch government saw Swedish Skraliga as an important strategic objective. Not only would it remove a potential Swedish threat, it would be a thorn in the side of New England, and the English and the Dutch had competing claims in the area, specifically in the Connecticut River Valley, 
where Connecticut had taken over a Dutch fort you know, present day Hartford in 1653. So if the Dutch could get fortification on the other side of New England, they'd surround them from two sides. So Director General Stuyvesant sent a squadron of ships to the islands and they landed a fort at Raspaha and then sieged Littenvik, which used to be called Smarvik, from both sides on the 3rd of August, 1657. And you can see these movements on the map on screen. Given the vast firepower discrepancy, though, between the small settlement and the Dutch force, Littenvik surrendered without a fight. The southern end of Storain was under control, so the Dutch forces moved north. They blockaded Skrelingborg from the west and the south, putting Carlsborg, formerly Christianborg, under siege. After They did put up a fight, but with the lack of any reinforcements in any amount of time, continuing the fight would just postpone the, ine postpone the inevitable. And so on the 9th of August, 1657, Skreliger became part of New Netherland. After the Dutch invasion, Skreliger was now controlled by New Amsterdam. Skreliger was now known as Nederland Skreligerlanden. The region was given quite a bit of autonomy. The Skreligen thing had existed under Danish and Swedish occupation as an advisory body, but was now given formally, formal authority of the islands, but still under the ultimate control of Director General Stuyvesant. There was no full census taken out during the Dutch occupation, but some of the settlements were renamed, as was tradition with every new ruler. Under the Dutch, the truce with the Abenaki continued, but there was no truce with the Northney settlement. Those English settlers at some point tried to expand across the channel onto Storian itself. This would have been a much more significant violation of Dutch, Dutch land claims. They were willing to put up with an incursion onto mostly on, on the mostly uninhabited island of Northney, but reaching to the mainland wouldn't really be something they could ignore. Um, thankfully for the Dutch, though, the Abenaki were armed with muskets and easily repelled any English attempts to cross over. This right here is the main time lapse, covering some of the development in the later Swedish period and the beginning of the Dutch, uh, Dutch occupation. To start, we're just covering the densification of some of the towns now getting more immigrants, having some population growth now that the various diseases aren't quite as bad. Also get to put down some of the Dutch houses by Jas uh, from his Silt series. And they look really nice in the outskirts near all the farms and everything. And then Nordstad here is has really been growing the most proportionally, um, especially because it's right across the river from Skrelingborg. I imagine in the future that uh, growth will continue to grow and it'll be kind of the same city, but there's no bridges or anything yet for a little while. Some of the English village, the UK village um, buildings by Rick 4000 are here. And then at this point, I'm also looking, I was also just checking, like, oh, well, the American colonial houses fit in, but not quite there yet. I think we're going to have to wait till the 1700s until they can really really fit in. So the problem is that colonial architecture 
definitely started in the 1600s, but it was a lot more basic. And at this point in time, like, Scrambling Borg is much more advanced just in the fact that it's been around for a while. So I'm not sure that, like, the early colonial architecture quite fits yet. So we'd need more sophisticated colonial architecture, but the sophisticated colonial architecture belongs to next century. Um, so that's kind of like the alternate history complication here. And Skralingborg is getting a lot more building here. Focusing a lot more on the church and market district here. Yeah, the port doesn't really get too many updates here. And then for the rest of this time lapse it is mostly focusing on something that I don't think I've really shown on camera as much. Just building out all the farms. Because um, I know one of the common ways people do farms is using like the um, like painting the resources, so like the ore and the farm resource and um, and oil, but like using different textures to make it look like farms. But that was never quite enough detail for me. Um, so I kind of mess around with all the different decals. And one of the things I had started doing vineyards because, well, you can grow grapes here. And part of the whole reason why Vinland was called Vinland was there were vines of grapes. And the climate's sure as hell better here than it is in Newfoundland. Uh, and the climate was a little bit different when they landed, but um, it started getting colder after they landed in Finland. And that was kind of, yeah, you know, climate change, except in the other direction is kind of why in real life the Greenland colonies didn't work out. And as I already mentioned, it's yeah, it's the climate change, it was the erosion, it was new people coming from the West that they didn't get along with. There are a whole bunch of different reasons that no one's really certain of. The big new thing that I realized I probably should have put in earlier uh, was just orchards. It's like growing some fruits on fruit on trees. So I don't think yeah, the Skrellingans wouldn't have originally started growing or like started like intentionally growing the fruit growing like apple trees and stuff but there's definitely evidence that like Native Americans did in the area. So that's one of those things that probably should have been around from the beginning, but only on the native side and then would have come around. But they're here now. We finally have some nice orchards.
this point in time, this part of North America was now in the control of just two European powers, England and the Dutch Republic. These two powers had a significant commercial and maritime rivalry throughout the whole 17th century. And even when they were at peace, their trade companies had their own warships and were frequently in conflict. And the oversimplification is that they had corporations that went to war with each other. It's one of the big grievances between the two were the English Navigation Acts, which required all trade with English ports, including colonial English ports, to be done with English ships. The Dutch were a lot more laissez-faire about which ships could trade in their ports. And so this put the Dutch at a commercial disadvantage. The first Anglo-Dutch war broke out between the Commonwealth in England and the Dutch Republic between 1652 and 54. And while England won that war, the commercial rivalry was entirely unresolved. The English were agitating for another war. Some of the aggression of their trading companies included capturing a Dutch trading outpost on Cap Verde, in late 1663. Later that year, King Charles II granted his brother James, who would later become King James II, the land from the Delaware River to the Connecticut River, land which included New Netherland, and also included the already existing colony of Connecticut. They weren't very good at keeping their borders consistent, even with their own colonies. In May of 1664, Colonel Nichols set out from Portsmouth, England, and then, after enlisting the support of English militias on Long Island, arrived at New Amsterdam on the 4th of September. Now, Nichols had proposed a fairly lenient surrender agreement, which included the continuation of Dutch property rights and freedom of religion in order to encourage a peaceful surrender, because in an intact colony, it would be much more useful than one that was completely devastated. Peter Stuyvesant was initially inclined to resist the surrender, but then all the burghers and his son met up with him to force him to concede, and the Articles of Surrender of New Netherland were signed on the 6th of September. The English sent troops up the Hudson River, and Fort Orange promptly surrendered on the 24th of September. It was to be renamed Fort Albany, Former New Sweden was captured in October, and then on the 24th of October, a squadron of ships arrived outside Willem Fort in Skrælika. Willem Fort used to be Carlsborg, which used to be Christianborg. They, of course, had to change the name of the fort every time. Skrælika was given the same terms as New Amsterdam, and the Dutch garrison promptly surrendered. Skrælika, apart from Northley, was now to be part of the province of New York. That was chapter seven of Skrælika. It was definitely a lot more history heavy and less city skylines heavy, partly because we had two new countries ruling over Skrælika. So next update is definitely going to cover more time, mainly because as much as I want to do plenty of detail, you know, I also want to get to the point where I can finally start running trains. <laughs> um, I think that's, that's that's the main goal. Get some trains going and turn this into a, a real city. But I hope you enjoyed seeing the a little bit of the history there. Um, next up will be Skrælika under the province of New York. Um, yes, it is a little bit out of place because it's right next to Massachusetts. And they're not super happy about that, but we'll get to that. Um, so yeah, until then, have a good one.